Hey, what's going on, guys, and welcome to the Amateur Ages podcast. I know the last tier list uh, rambled uh, on pretty long, and trust me, it was a whole lot longer before some of the other issues we had, but we've changed it a little bit, and we're going to kind of reduce the list for today, uh, but we're going to get to all of them eventually. I think it's 25, 24 in total, so by the end of this, it's going to probably be around three videos, maybe four, but um, yeah, so we're going to kick things off off with another tier list or we're adding on to the already existing tier list and I'm joined once again by Jeff uh, the history master himself well <laughs> we're both amateurs that's the name of the podcast but uh, he's the one who's uh, got uh, a lot of the information on these uh, this was your idea in your area of expertise so why don't you kind of start this by explaining the criteria for our tier list here Jeff all right, sounds good. Will do. Uh, so today, as he said, uh, we did 10 empires last time. We're going to be doing five. Try to keep it a little tighter uh, the next few here. Uh, our criteria, uh, just to recap from the uh, the last video, we are trying to keep it between the year 0 and 1700 for the largest extent of the empires. We did push it a little bit for some of them that went a little over or a little under, but we're still majorly within that range, so we tried to keep it to them. Um, this isn't the greatest empires of all time. We tried to keep it to the best empires that we could come up with, but in order to keep it so that we're not throwing everything in like A tier and S tier, we mix it up a little bit. There's some some good ones, and then there's some great ones. So uh, a, a bit of a range, and you'll see that as we go on through the episodes a little more. You know, when you're covering 25 of them, they can't all be great. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> some of them are flops, you know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, we have our old, uh, t or where we have assigned people from our first episode of the tier list already up here. If you want to find out more about any of those, of course, head back and watch episode one, and you can see all of our input on all of those, as well as get a little bit of a better sense, if you don't recognize the logos up there, of which one belongs to which empire. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that, Jeff. Also, uh, I've put these all into a playlist as well, so if you want to hear a lot more of these or maybe you want to catch up, uh, you can certainly uh, click the link to the playlist itself, and that should pop up on screen right about now in the top corner. I got that one for you, Jeff. You don't have to edit anything in for that one, but um, <laughs> I'm curious where we're going to start on this one because... Uh, I'm not really sure where we wrapped up, to be honest with you. It's been a while now. I don't really remember. So where, where are we starting today? Yeah, this is going to look really close together for you guys, but in reality, we're recording these about a month apart. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so in case uh, you didn't catch the opening of the last one, uh, we are randomizing the order that we pick them in. I have them all set into a randomizer here. So let's get it going here to see what one is the first one that we're going to go with today randomizing and we have the uh sasanian empire sasanian or the sassanid empire for if you prefer okay well i'm uh, scrolling through my uh prep here and i'm just trying to make sure that i can't even find it in my prep that's how long it's been since we did this how do i spell it Jeff? See, this is the this is the benefit of putting things alphabetical uh, <laughs> uh it would be <laughs> it would be S A S. Uh, I think I misspelled it in the thing I sent you for, so it's probably S A S A. Uh, I found it. it. Should be two S's. I found it. Okay, <laughs> I might have spelled it wrong too. I'm not sure. I have S A S A N I A N. All right. It, it happens. It happens. All right. We're going through a lot of different languages here, trying to take them over. Sometimes we're going to spell things wrong. Okay. It happens. Um, so. So the Sassanid Empire uh, reigned between 224 to 651. They were a Middle Eastern Arabic Empire, uh, Muslim Empire, um, often known as the Empire of the Iranians. Um, I did note as well that they were sometimes referred to as the Neo-Persian Empire. Yes, yes. They were a precursor to, uh, well, a precursor to the more uh, closer to modern era um Middle Eastern empires that are sort of more, more popular or more well known in uh, in history nowadays, but a very significant empire in their own rights. They built and revived many of the great Parthian cities. Uh, they developed very advanced siege equipment for the time. They had a very well equipped military, which relied heavily on cavalry, which I know is one of Martin's Gotta favorite love things. Horseback. Um, yeah. 
um, it was an age of Persian Renaissance, uh, an age of intellectual advancement, and it laid the foundations that would lead to the fast success of the subsequent Islamic rulers of Persia and the rest of the Middle East, of course. At their peak, 40 million people, making up 20% of the world's population at the time, taking up about three and a half million square kilometers. That is an absolutely uh, huge track of land. It's like it, when you look at the continent, like where like their history, they really did expand through like a little bit of Asia, a little bit of Africa. It was a lot of people. It, it always surprises me when we're talking about ancient empires and you're talking about numbers like 40 million people. Like to me, that's just it's mind numbing to imagine that many people living in one place back in those times you know do you get where i'm coming from with that jeff yeah it, it's funny for me it, 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 sometimes i have to kind of suspend the disbelief and it's kind of the opposite because of the sheer volumes of population we have nowadays but you got to remember you know that's that big surge in population didn't come until you know much later than the eras that we're talking about where things just started to exponentially grow population wise so um for me, I, I don't know. Some, sometimes I get the opposite, but sometimes I, I, I do feel where you're coming from on that too. It's it's this weird mix for me. <laughs> Our population here in Canada is 38 million. You know what I mean? Like that's what mm. I don't know. That's just where what my metric is. So when I see an empire from the 200s at 40 million, I'm just like. If this was like punches, like if this was fists, hand-to-hand -hand combat, they'd beat modern Canada in a war. <laughs> a sheer numbers game, you know? I mean, to be fair, um, we spend, what, 1% of our budget on the military? So uh, I'm pretty sure they spent a heck of a lot more than that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we wouldn't stand a chance against their cavalry. Somewhere like 80%, I'd probably say, that kind of... Uh... <laughs> um, I should also note, at the beginning, I when I said uh, Muslim Empire, I meant precursor to the Muslim Empires. Obviously, we're talking about <laughs> expiring up in 671, so it came before the major Muslim Empires. But it did lay yeah. the groundworks for the massive expansion that they would see uh, throughout the next couple hundred centuries um, after the uh, the Sasanians would fall, which was, of course, to those, uh, those up-and-coming uh, Muslim Empires. For me, though, because of all the work that they did to lay that foundation and because of the massive intellectual advancements that came under them, and 427 years is no slouch of a reign. Like, that's that's nothing to turn your nose up. Yeah, at. they were one of, I know that they're kind of referred to as Neo, a Neo-Persian Empire, but they are technically one of the longest lived uh, Persian imperial dynasties. So they definitely were a long lived culture. Um, did you mention that they, I found that they were also a multicultural society as well. I know you referred to it as like a precursor uh, Islamic nation, but uh, they mm -hmm. also it was a place where a variety of religions was practiced. It wasn't like yeah. some of the other areas uh, further down the line where it was one major religion was kind of the de facto religion of that area. They helped to kind of uh, revitalize, uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation because I always do, uh, Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism, I think is, <laughs> I, I, I don't know why it's one word that no matter how many times I, I just, I can't, Zoroastrianism, I can't get it right, Z Zor Zoroastrianism, 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 whoa, that's there. so wild, that's I just it. typed in Zoro um, and it popped up, that's, <laughs> this must be a very common issue for people to pronounce it. It's the, I can see why, all right? It's a hard conversion from the O at the in Ian at the end. Anyway, um, we're not talking linguistics here. Um, <laughs> um, was, of course, the main religion. They, they kind of revitalized that, and it was the state religion, so to speak. But, um, of course, yes, they were unique in that. Uh, and, and, again, laying the precursors to the acceptance of multiple religions that the early Muslim empires would have, whether that's because they had to, uh, because of the populations or not, it did lay the groundwork for that and help with that massive expansion, with that acceptance early on. But of course, also, as you could see, leads to part of their downfall as well because of, well, who eventually took over after them, right? Taking all that in mind and considering all that, though, um, what, what did you give them? Uh, I actually gave them a fairly low rank. Um, I gave them D rank. Um, they had a pretty powerful navy. Um, which was like 
kind of gave them a little extra points. Uh, they used that for kind of controlling the region, like the Persian Gulf. They limited piracy, um, and it helped to defend against the Romans uh, and things like that. But even though they were one of the longest living uh, Persian imperial dynasties at the time, they weren't super long live, and they just they're almost like the the beta empire, you know, where it's like they're like, hey, the there's a lot of empires that do what they do better. And I just, because of that, I just gave them a lower rank. So that's interesting because uh, th this is probably the first one that we've been this far apart on. Uh, because for me, I gave them an A tier. Um, oh, okay. I think they, they, they're, they're massive advancements in military. They're massive advancements in urbanization. Um, how centralized their government was is incredibly unique. Um, you'll see a pattern as we go through these empires about their overall governments and their overall bureaucracy and that being very decentralized yeah. as they expand. Um, out of necessity, a lot of times, because you cover many cultures and span many um, different varieties of people, many different affluencies of people, uh, and many different terrains, right? Yeah, it wasn't as uniform as it is now. The Middle East is a little bit more unique in that they do have sort of a consistent uh, terrain throughout, of course, still many cultures throughout, but they have similarities to them because they all share very similar situations and environments. Mm -hmm. Uh, could lead to making it slightly easier, but they did maintain a very centralized government, especially for the time and among the empires that were ranking across this list. And for me, um, bureaucratic and government advancements are what we can see having the most impact on things today and what lead to um, the biggest structure that we get in our society today. So for me, their, their, their bureaucracy, their centralized government, and their architecture, which I haven't even touched on yet, that would lay massive groundwork for both what would become uh, over the next few centuries, the mainstay of architecture in both the Islamic empires and the Islamic empires in Iberia, as well as the Middle East, and eventually even into the Catholic empires that would rule Iberia in later years. So for me, because of just the massive impact that they laid and the extent of their rule, I mean, 427 years is still one of the longest reigning empires yeah. we have on this list. Um, so yeah, for me, I, I gave them an A tier. Is this... This is going to sound kind of strange, but is this the same empire where, like, the term assassin comes from, just based on the spelling of their empire? Uh, I don't think so. I think assassin, if I remember correctly, was a surname of uh, a that's family right. that's... in India originally, if yeah. I recall okay. correctly. Okay, we had this conversation when we got to this empire last time, and we realized that this podcast <laughs> has been running on for way too long. And I was like, so, so maybe you were right. Maybe uh, it won't be too hard to backtrack over these things after all, because the th same thoughts are coming back, <laughs> Jeff. Um, you know what? I can concede to that in terms of I didn't realize the depth of their centralized government. I mean, if they were... Because the way I was perceiving it is that we were seeing a lot of downfalls being caused by, uh, like, yes, the multiculturalism and stuff like that was great in these ancient kingdoms. But when you don't have a central leadership like that, it, it just breeds possibilities for, like, civil war it's... and things breaking up. And I didn't realize that they had actually uh, such a focused centralized government. So, I mean, that definitely changes things. Um, but I think my one opinion still does kind of stand. While they they were the pioneering people, at the end of the day, there what they the lessons that they basically learned ultimately were applied to future empires that they did executed it far better. I think one thing we have to keep in mind too when ranking them is that they were able to rise during the middle of the third century collapse and still maintain prominence for 427 years you compare that to similar uh dynasties empires realms in general at the time and it's a very stark contrast you look at the massive decline of the roman empire in the uh, uh during the third century i mean it's called the third century collapse for a reason right most societies divulged into darkness it was the it was the precursor to the middle ages that led to you know um that the age the, the dark ages right yeah but they were able to rise up in the middle of that and somehow maintain uh, an empire among that time lasting for 427 years hmm. so uh, even if you say they didn't you know that empires came after might have done things better than them if you compare them to their contemporaries and what they were able to do amid 
strife, amid famines, amid, um, you know, all of the things that were plaguing um, society during during the third century. Um, and they they were able to, to, to brave through that to manage to advance culture and advance development. Hmm. See, this is why you're the man with the facts, because I didn't even take into consideration the, the time period that they were going, uh, that this was all taking place in. All right. So I, I'll obviously raise my uh, very pitiful rank that I gave them of D and... I still have uh, some of my own opinions there, but you said A. I don't. I don't hate the B. Want to go with B? All right. Yeah, I I can do I'll, B. I'll, I'll I'll concede a B. Let's 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 go with a B. All right. B for them. Let's check on the next one. It's going to be. Uh, we have the Great Jin Dynasty. It is an Asian dynasty. Yes, uh, a Chinese dynasty, in fact, ruled between the years. Uh, 1115 when it when it's when it's two ones in a row it's always my mind confused do i say 1115 or do i say like 1001 anyway. <laughs> um 1115 and 1234 of the common era of course 119 years there of course as um as they were ruling out of a densely populated portion of the world 53 million people about 15 yeah. percent of the world's uh, population at the time again a huge amount of people 15 percent of the global population that that's just insane to imagine. Also known as the Second Jin Dynasty, for those of you who are uh, Chinese Dynasty masters out there, we are talking about the Second Jin Dynasty, of course, still fitting into <laughs> our criteria, which the first one would not. But you can't <laughs> call it the Second Dynasty. You have to call it the Great Dynasty, you know? And New Jin doesn't sound as good as, like, Original Jin. So Great Jin was the obvious choice. Sounds like a Dragon Ball Z villain. <laughs> The Great Jin, <laughs> totally yeah for no, sure. No New Jin, no, New Jin. Oh yeah, New Jin definitely sounds like uh, a Dragon Ball Z uh, villain for sure. So the um, you are right in saying that it was a, a large empire though, because uh, the empire covered much of uh, Inner Asia and all of present day North China. So a lot of space was taken up there, and uh, they had uh, I believe they set up a dual administration system. So it was like a Chinese style bureaucracy. Uh, to like rule over the southern part um, and uh, they had a tribal state to control the nomadic tribes of inner Asia so I thought that was really fascinating actually if they had a strong land military a great cavalry their navy was incredibly weak at a time when it was becoming more important to have a strong navy they did make significant contributions to the arts particularly drama and they were very good hunters we talked about the central authority of uh being a leading factor uh with the Sassanid empire we got the complete opposite here very limited central authority they were very poor at managing politics which you can see in their in their short reign ultimately helping to lead to their downfall on top of you know other stronger sort of powers moving into the yeah. area I thought it was interesting, too, that, um, you know, they became well known for their arts, but they originally started as like a very fierce uh, warrior culture. And over time, much like a fine wine, they began to mature and they eventually settled. Right. Um, which, as you said, with combining with their poor Navy um, kind of became poor timing because eventually they ended up falling to the Mongols and uh, the Northern Song Dynasty. So. It's one of those things, right, where you have to, it's like skip, uh, specking into a skill tree in a video game where you got to put some points into being able to defend yourself. You can't just put it all into the cool stuff, you know? <laughs> You've also got to pay attention to the meta, too, and realize that the Mongols are rising. Everyone else is putting all their points into military, and you're over here putting yours into crafting. And it's not really working out no. too well for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great metaphor for their basically their empire. <laughs> uh, I'll cut to it with uh, with this one. Short, Short-lived short empire, so uh, shorter time in the video, I suppose, for me. I gave them a D tier. That's so funny because I gave them a D tier as well. And it's it's funny because they had a huge population. Um, they lasted quite a long time, like about 120 years. Not too bad. But um, they just kind of fizzled out. They also kind of, you, you mentioned their huge population, that they also kind of rested on the laurels of dynasties that came before them in that sense too. Whereas yeah. the region was building up 
population over the centuries before and we all know the population of china even today it's massive right and it hasn't just become that overnight right it's been growing for a very long period of time such a densely populated section of the world right and a lot of what they had was sort of gifted to them and it was sort of this um we've talked about it before with other emperors sort of this uh, empire sorry sort of this constant state of decline almost um which ultimately is not going to help you uh, when the Mongols come knocking. Yeah, because, you know, it comes to this thing where people can, they lose the focus. When a nation's starting a lot of its infrastructure and all those things, and then eventually it becomes politics, um, it becomes squabbles with neighbors, it's things that take away from what allowed them to be successful in the first place, right? And something as destabilizing as a new empire or uh, something like the Mongols it makes it hard for a community to set hold and thrive and you know it's pretty typical in terms of like even our own uh, modern times like you and i do better during the good times you know we can take (laughs) risks we can go out into the world and try new things but when it's kind of feast or famine you you don't want to take those risks and except maybe the last two or three years (laughs) (laughs) yeah but yeah you know what i mean it stagnates everything but you know i'll tell you what after i I put gas in my car yesterday and i definitely feel like we're a nation in decline after that (laughs) (laughs) you're close to the alberta border you uh jaunt over there a little quick trip there you're gonna save yourself like 30 bucks a tank yeah it's gonna cost me 100 bucks a gas to get there though (laughs) fill up some jerry cans while you're there all right let's do it we're gonna give it a detour then we both agree on the same ranking an easy one to slot in there for that beautiful uh let's see what's next on the list here we have the fatimid caliphate the fatimid caliphate very cool uh, named, a well-named empire. Yeah, I'm trying to, okay, I found them. So I finally found the Fatimid Caliphate in my prep. So uh, they were around from uh, the year 909 to around 1171 CE. uh, So about 262 years. And uh, they had a population of six a uh, million, uh, 500,000, so around 3% of the global population at the time. And uh, they were the dynasty that ruled a lot of North Africa. So uh, the Fatimid rule was kind of renowned for toleration as uh, the Sunni Muslims, the Christians, and uh, Jewish nations occupied significant public offices, which I think is really cool because every position was appointed purely on merit. It really had nothing to do with your background. It was really the skill that you brought to the table. Uh, They also appear to have valued women's contributions, which were almost non-existent at this time within uh, the Sunni world. So again, another point, they were basically like like super modern thinking people for this time. And uh, the Fatimids did much to promote uh, Islamic scholarship, uh, sponsored missionary outreach, sending missionaries as far as India and Central Asia. And uh, they also transformed Egypt's economic status by developing an alternative trade route to the East. Like they, they have a lot of achievements here, and uh, they very nearly succeeded in achieving their goal of ruling the whole Muslim world. And uh, I believe they were called the Zirids, uh, who are kind of the governors of North Africa under the Fatimids. Uh, they declared their independence from the Fatimids, and uh, they're, they can kind of converted to these Orthodox Sunni Islam, which led to the devastating Banu Hilal invasions, and after the decay of the Fatimid political system in the 1160s, uh, the Zengid ruler uh, dispatched his general, and uh, they seized Egypt, and then eventually the Zengrids, or am I saying this wrong? I think I just have typos in my prep here, but the Zirids, not the Zengrids, uh, the Zirids had replaced (laughs) uh, the Seljuks with the sultans of Syria and Iraq, and... I don't know. I thought that this was a really interesting thing because this brought up a topic between you and I in that it seems like being it's it's strange, right? Because on one end, giving people jobs based on merit, the jobs that they do and allowing a ton of diverse people into like the government obviously is a good thing. But when we're talking about ancient times, the same thing can't be applied, you know, the same lens that we view today's world through we can't do the same when we're talking about the Fatima Caliphate because that ultimately is what was their decline because whether they weren't giving fair treatment to those people, whether or not they felt as though they were being neglected in the greater country, the fact that there was this huge revolution that basically forced them to lose 
wide tracts of their land just ultimately led to their downfall. So I don't know. We talked about this a lot, Jeff, and you kind of turned me on to this idea too, in that, yeah, it's great that this nation was super uh, forward thinking in terms of how women were uh, respected and given an opportunity con to contribute in the political sphere. Uh, but th And you have all these different cultures, religious beliefs, and everything like that. But when you have such a wide tract of land, you just lose control. And ultimately, that's what led to their downfall. And I know I've rambled on a little bit about this because I'm trying to keep track of all my prep here, but I gave them a rank B. So I don't know. What's uh, your take on that, Jeff? We're, we're fairly close on this one. Um, for me, um, they, they did make uh, large contributions to art, as you mentioned, and architecture, of course. Yeah. Uh, however, they're, they were significantly less powerful and influential than other Muslim caliphates. Mm -hmm. um, you, you bring up a good point that also sort of matches with other empires that we've discussed already, similar to the Holy Roman Empire, actually, the, what would eventually lead to its decline, not so much as the Holy Roman Empire, but as the Austrian Empire that would succeed it, in that when you have all these different cultures, you have to then strike a balance between how much power is given to them, mm -hmm. right? And it's like you said, if we look at it through a modern lens, we all value equality now, right? You know, I'm sure anyone we talk to would say we want everyone to be valued equally, right? But at the time, that wasn't the case in most places, right? So when you have all these different cultures, you have to look for this balance between how much power to give them and how much is going to end up being too much that they want more, right? Um, or independence, so to speak, right? Which ultimately happened with the Seleucs, with the Fatimid Caliphate, um, when they ended up losing their power. Although they did uh, rule out of uh, Cairo for a little bit longer afterwards, just not at the empire yeah. level. Um, but, and it's similar to what I mentioned with the Austrian Empire, that is sort of uh, a more modern comparison in most people's uh, minds, because we know how it declined during World War One, where they gave so much autonomy to all the other cultures, the, the Croatians, the Serbians, uh, the Hungarians, that eventually they all wanted out, basically. They wanted their own independence, right? And they got it eventually and led to the collapse of the empire. And we see that same thing sort of happen with a lot of empires over time. So the ones that last the longest are the ones that can strike the best balance between keeping their people happy and not giving away too much power. Um, I gave the Fatimids a C tier rank, okay. um, so slightly lower than yours, and I think that that mainly for me leads to the fact that the empires that immediately succeeded and preceded them both had significantly more influence, um, and it's yeah to me it's just a matter of uh, of comparisons with what they were able to do compared to what others were able to do and how ultimately short their reign was yes you know 262 years isn't exactly a tiny amount of time but no. again we run into a thing where a lot of that was civil war that they had to manage and deal with throughout that so it was a lot less consistent reign and a lot more fighting to keep that reign which you know isn't unique to them by any means of course uh but to me all of that added up to to put them in C tier on my end. All right. Uh, I kind of get that. Um, I th was curious about the origin of the name of the Fatimid uh, Caliphate. Uh, it's uh, They are named after uh, Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. Interesting, because I know uh, my on my mom's side, I'm Portuguese, and Fatima is a very common and popular name. And I was curious because a lot of those, you know, a lot of the religions are very uh, closely connected when you look back at their origins. And I know that where my mom's family's from in Portugal is a very Christian area. And a lot of those religious names kind of get interchanged at a certain point. And that's why I was curious about to, it because Fatimid. To be fair, and like, we'll talk about it more when we do get to the Umayyad uh, Caliphate and that, but um, Iberia for a long time was under Muslim rule. And so a lot of the names, um, I would imagine, 
translate over with each other, right? Names yeah, that are makes more sense. are more of a regional thing over time. Obviously, the origins of names, mm-hmm. most names are rooted in some kind of religious aspect. Yeah. Um, but over time, that religious aspect kind of fades away from it and becomes more of a regional thing, right? Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, even if this family lives in the same area for super long and the, 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 the dominant religion changes or they convert to, you know, say not have to pay as much taxes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or something like that, right? That doesn't mean that they're going to stop naming especially in ancient times uh stop naming their kids after ancestors and such yeah that makes a lot more sense than my weird i could be pulling that completely out of my backside here and that could have nothing to do with why those origins are what they are but i just it could be an interesting no and that makes sense and i think that's an important thing to tie this uh, back together and uh, we'll wrap this up quickly but i think that's one of the big reasons why uh, the fatima caliphate uh uh, valued the w- women's contribution to society as well, right? Because uh, the city or the caliphate was named after Muhammad's daughter. So uh, that's uh, an interesting um, an interesting empire for sure. Uh, but uh, did we meet in the middle on this one or who's budging? B or C? I mean, what, what's what's the middle? Is it like a, a C plus? Is that the, <laughs> is that the middle? I don't know. <laughs> it's just right on the line. I mean, we've already made the chart. We can't adjust it at this point. Um, I don't know. I can. Can we give them an extra point for girl power? <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. Why not? We can put them in B tier. All right. There we go. <laughs> there you go, ladies. We got an empire on the board for you. Although it is worth noting that at the time, most of the Middle Eastern empires were very much uh, accepting of women's place in society yeah. and such. So I don't want to single them out. So, so to speak. Um, all right, so next up we have, okay, this is another one I'm going to need to kind of explain the position on the list, especially if you didn't listen to the, the first episode, which, by the way, <clears throat> maybe you should. Um, it's the Kalmar Union, which is a Scandinavian uh, quote-unquote empire. The reason I put it in as an empire is because it is technically a union of multiple realms, multiple countries, multiple kingdoms into one to fall under one ruler right so for me it's it it does fit into the criteria of an empire and fits within our time period and and all of uh, all of that fun stuff um it was uh of course as i said scandinavian uh ruled between 1397 to 1523 126 years 2.9 million square kilometers but only 4 million people which at the time was only one percent of the world's population It was very unstable from its inception. Uh, Each individual kingdom was strong on its own, but the union itself was constantly challenged. What I like about uh, this is that everything seemed to be going pretty good, and then you have the most unexpected rebellious teenager comes in and ruins it all. Sweden, of all countries. Like, I wouldn't have guessed Sweden. Isn't that how it always works? It's always the one you don't (laughs) expect. It's like, gosh, I should have expected Sweden would rebel against us in the end. But no, um, so the Kalmar Union did last until uh, Sweden rebelled and became independent in 1523. Um, lots of great names in the story, uh, including the king that took over there, uh, King Gustav. Um, what is that? One Vasa? What is that? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, <laughs> you got it right there, Vasa. Did I? Um, king king now... Gustav One Vasa? Is that right? I have a typo here like crazy. So, again... Both of us are, are, are amateurs here, uh, so uh, don't keep any of us sort of, don't quote any of us on the pronunciation of things. Um, to me, I've always just heard it as uh, Gustav Vasa. There's, if you go on the internet and Google any of these people, you're going to find uh, different translations through all the different languages, right? Of course. Because, of course... We're spanning multiple different uh, native tongues here as we go over these things, and we're trying to uh, to do as best we can here. But sometimes that's not easy. Um, yeah, and it doesn't help that I'm. I should have reviewed some of this prep a little bit more. But um, yeah, back to my main point. Lots of well named people like uh, King Gustav Vasa, and um, another interesting point. It's kind of weird to think of this part of the world in this way. You know, Sweden being rebellious. Um, but uh, Norway also sank uh, to the status uh, status of a Danish province in 1536 as well. So it was kind of a downgrade for everybody who got themselves involved in it. Now, the history of Scandinavia kind of has a lot of merging and disconnecting over time. You know, there's, there's uh, 
you know, the, the Danish people and the Norwegians have merged together before, the Swedes and the Norwegians, the Swedes and the Danes. It's It's been a constant sort of flux uh, between them and a constant merging of families over time and such as well. So the way that the countries are defined today is not how they've been throughout most of history, right? There's been a lot of joining and separation over that time. And the Kalmar Union is no different. That instability that was that has been with that region throughout history was very present during the Kalmar Union as well and of course played a hand in its downfall. I will note though, in my opinion, the coolest looking flag of any of the Scandinavian flags. I mean, they all have the same sort of pattern, but that red and yellow combination for me just just takes the cake the scandinavian flags always look like something that you might find in like some kind of medieval text somewhere i mean it's it's, it's fair enough they they probably i mean the origins are from the time right so how i guess 13th 15th century i mean i guess that's medieval times technically no i think this is a, a an interesting it was kind of a monarchy which um, I find interesting, and it's weird because right, it was like three monarchies that became one monarchy, right? Like, f- or rather, four monarchies that became three, or one. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, four four realms of different, you know, statures, so to speak, um, and okay. different um, power levels and, and different, you know, um, views in society at the time. But all of them individually uh, strong enough. Uh, but together, just a lot of dysfunction. All right. I appreciate you being able to translate my uh, mutterings today. I'm obviously having a hard time. Um, but uh, I gave uh, the Kalmar Union a rank D. I, I also gave them a D. Uh, it might be, uh, I, I don't know, low-hanging fruit to put them on the list for this. But as I said, all 25 can't be great. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, they, they, they for me, uh, I, I also slotted them into a D tier. Sweden's like, I don't want to be a part of this anyway. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, Sweden's the rebellious teenager. I mean, it's it's always the teenager. It's. <laughs> I'm imagining Sweden in like a leather jacket, hair all grease back. It's like the thick black shades, like he's from uh, Grease Lightning or something like that. <laughs> it's like Sweden's like, I'm too cool for you. I'm heading out of here. It's played by John Travolta for some reason in my mind. Hey, yo, Susie, I'm getting out of here. We're going (laughs) back to Sweden. On that note, the last of our five for today's episode. (laughs) This is an interesting one. The Ottoman Empire. Uh, One of the ones that will probably be more familiar to most listeners um, one thing I was surprised by this is I had obviously was aware of them before this research. Um, I mean, they were around for a really long time, but I didn't realize um, how like recent in terms of history all of this actually went down because it's easy to think about our time existing like eons in the future i mean just kind of based on our technology and things like that but uh the ottoman empire lasted from 1453 to 1923 so 470 years and think about that the 1920s the roaring 20s jeff the ottoman empire was just well it wasn't roaring it was kind of muttering and (laughs) it was wrapping up you know what's funny we are recording this right now on May 28th, right? Yeah. The Ottoman Empire officially became an empire when they sieged and took Constantinople, the fall of Constantinople, where it obviously got renamed shortly afterwards to today's title of Istanbul, right? Mm-hmm. You know what date that was? No. May 29th, oh. 1453. All right. So, <laughs> I mean, I'll make sure to celebrate tomorrow. Thanks for the tip, Jeff. <laughs> The 99th anniversary of the fall of Constantinople. Isn't that wild, though? That's my point. It's only the 99th. Like, I love how these big empires, they feel like they were, like, forever ago, almost as if they happened in another world. And yet this happened less than 100 years ago. You know how long human beings have been flying, Jeff? Like, in planes? It's like, I think it's like 110 years. Like, literally, maybe Mm -hmm. 125 tops. So the Ottoman Empire is part of recent history. Sorry, I'm getting hung up on this, but you're right. 
They're from the fall of uh, Constantinople. Uh, like you said, um, uh, they were opposite to the Romans. They burned really bright, and even though they last 470 years, they ultimately uh, did not last forever. Uh, they conquered vast amounts of land. Uh, they defeated Rome and eventually the Byzantines. Uh, check them out. I think we mentioned them in the first podcast. Uh, they took control of parts Indeed. of Persia, most of Arabia, and large sections of Hungary and the Balkans. Uh, by the early 16th century, though, the Ottomans had also defeated the, the Mamluk dynasty in Syria and Egypt. Am I pronouncing that right? Mamluk. I believe. Mamluk? <laughs> okay, so they conquered, uh, they defeated the Mamluk dynasty in Syria and Egypt, and uh, their navy under Barbarossa soon seized uh, control of most of the Barbary coast, and uh, they ultimately made Constantinople their capital city. And uh, the Ottoman uh, sultans were uh, the caliphates of the region and uh, the spiritual head of Islam, uh, Islam rather, and uh, they made it into the early modern era, assisting Germany in World War I. That, like, again, I'm still hung up on this. This empire was in World War I. <laughs> it's, it's just so cool to me. I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, <laughs> indeed, one of the more recent empires on our list, that is for sure. Uh, a, a constant, uh, they will come up very much as we talk about other empires throughout this list because they were constantly a pest to everyone around them <laughs> before they became an empire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're the reason, you know, they're chipping away for years at the Byzantine Empire. I mean, by the time Constantinople fell in 1453, the Byzantine Empire was only an empire in name. Yeah. It, it had Constantinople and then a little bit of southern Greece, right? And eventually the Ottomans took that too. So um, they, they, they were chipping away at the empire for a long time before Mehmed II finally was able to siege Constantinople and take it, one of the most famous and uh i mean world shaping events in in late um medieval history yeah. um i mean at, at some point i feel like someone needs to write a book on how the greatest empire in the world became turkey and the story of that is the ottoman empire so um <laughs> uh 5.2 million square kilometers at their max extent 24 million people uh 470 years in power their contributions to military were just um uh, just amazing especially siege yeah. warfare i mean just the fact that they were able to take down constantinople which it's not like people hadn't tried in the past people yeah. had tried many many times i mean it was named the unseizable well, city for a reason why do you think um, the byzantines camped out there for so long <laughs> It it yeah, it was uh, it's an impressive feat to have been able to take it down at all, and obviously their advancements in siege warfare. Uh, the first sort of um, I think they were called basilicus cannons, um, which oh, yeah. basically were just these these cannons that could only fire so many times because they would eventually just blow themselves up. Because what it basically was was just a really long tube filled with gunpowder. <laughs> and and then a cannonball yeah it's great and uh but they it made the difference in being able to take constantinople uh and again that's just the start of, of the empire that then maintained for another 470 years it, almost into the modern era uh past world war one even as you mentioned um although um Although they maintained power for a long time, we do see, again, sort of this decentralization of an empire yeah. where the ruling sultan had control, had very much control over the military aspects of things, Yeah, but not so much over the society or the day-to-day -day management of the empire and such. It was a lot of... Uh, um, a lot of delegating, which again, you know, can go either way, right? Yeah. Because uh, for an empire to truly succeed, you need to do a bit of delegating. You need to give up a little bit of power because one person can't rule 5.2 million square kilometers, right? But in this case, it did not end well, right? Because while the Ottoman sultans um, were the caliphates of, or the caliphs of the region and the spiritual heads, because they were letting other people kind of manage these areas, uh, eventually it was just corruption. I mean, like anything else, it just kind of snuck in, bad deals were made, and that was definitely one of the biggest contributors to, to their decline, for sure. Yeah, a lot of revolts began to pop up over the, the empire, civil wars and such over time. And again, the empire itself was very strong militarily. But over time, 
you know even the strongest militaries can't stand up to constantly being under pressure and and uh at, at risk of of uh, of splitting at the seams um a lot they they did manage to hold together for a very long time despite all of this going on which is yeah. you know something to their um you know in their corner as well a yeah. pro to them as well uh but we also see sort of a stagnation in a lot of the uh, the evolution of culture that we saw during the the dynasties that preceded them. Um, their decline was very fast um, after it started. Uh, so, also we, we can't put aside a lot of the uh, the bad of of how they treated other cultures as well i mean you know i don't want to mention specific things by name for risk of uh of this video being taken off youtube um but let's just call it uh ethnic cleansing yeah uh, that went on during the during the empire in a few different places um so despite the the massive peaks of their power there was a lot of peaks and a lot of valleys for them a very high ceiling and a very low floor Oh, doesn't that just make the ceiling even higher? <laughs> I mean, I gave them a pretty high rank, but that was, um, uh, I mean, cleansings aside, not that it excuses <laughs> anything. I mean, I can't even say it was from another time because it was 99 years ago. My goodness. Um, <laughs> that's so bad. You can't let that one go, huh? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to count down from three, and then we both just yell out what tier we gave them. Okay. Three, two, one, B S. tier. I said right. S, and now I feel terrible because now I feel like I'm supporting, like... No, it's K. Okay. <laughs> maniacs. <laughs> Again, the, uh, none of these empires that we talk about are going to be all sparkles and sunshine, right? Every empire know, here has dark times. A lot of them, I mean, the vast majority of them reigned during a period known as the Dark Ages. You know, they were very uncivilized compared to not only modern culture, but even most cultures that came before them. We forget that, you know, between the years 500 and 1500, we you know society as a whole became very devolved from what it was before that right yeah um and before it finally was able to start picking up again and so we get back to sort of where we are on that today right so um you know we we have to judge these empires by their contemporaries and by the other empires on the list and how successful they were as an yeah. empire. We're not judging them based on how much we like them or like what they yeah. did. It's a comparison between them and the success of the other empires on yeah. the list. I, I'm very much not pro-ethnic cleansing. So <laughs> let's just be clear In case with that, that needed to be stated. I mean, yes. <laughs> um, Look, I'm just covering my bases. Okay? I, I gave them a B tier. You gave them an S tier. Meet in the middle and go A. Yeah, uh, but I feel like the reason I the the I, the reason why I gave them an S tier was very simple. All right, because mm. it's like when we're talking about um, Islamic empires, I mean we're talking about like the big ones. No, when you're having your standard history conversation, not a lot of people are talking about the Kalmar Union uh, or anything like that. The one that you hear the most about is either the Persian Empire or the Ottoman Empire because of how long they lasted and because of how even people who just kind of aren't really aware of history, like, you know what I mean? Like people who don't really mm -hmm. care to like do deeper dives for the most part are aware of the Ottoman Empire. And that's why I gave them such a high rank because it's like Rome. It's like a lot of those iconic nations of that time. Like they even toppled the, one of the most iconic ancient cities, which is Constantinople, which I'm if we're talking about ancient cities, you know, you got Babylon come to mind. I'm talking like pop culture and stuff like that and what's regular people might think of. But Constantinople is definitely one of those places. So for me, it was more like how well they were remembered in modern times, which is what influenced me giving them the higher rank. Now, you're not wrong in any of that, but it's like you've said multiple times throughout here. I have to say how uh, how much of that is owed to the fact that it is if it is the most modern empire on our list, 
right? That's true. You say that a lot of people, you know, it rings through in a lot of people's minds and that, but it's also the closest to a lot of us. And for mm. a lot of people, the only thing they actually learn in school of the empires on our list, right? Because especially when you talk about North America, I mean, I don't know so much about the, the states, but in Canada, at least, you know, when we went through history, we did a little bit of medieval history, but nothing very specific. Yeah. And that was like elementary school, right? The only things we learn about in higher learning in, uh, you know, mandatory, at least in, in high school, and that is Canadian, North American, and, you know, history past like World War One, you know, the Great Depression, World War Two, that kind of stuff, right? Which they existed in at least the World War One yeah. portion of that, right? So uh, a lot of people will know of it just simply because it is the more modern of them, right? I think in terms of the impact on our society and that today, I think a lot of the Middle Eastern empires that came before them yeah. actually had more of an impact. Militaristically, no, the Ottomans had a tremendous impact yeah. that is probably greater than most of the empires that came before well, them. Well, they, they right? were making disposable cannons, you know, the, the, <laughs> they, had, they figured it out. You know, they they were the peak of just like that kind of battle, right? I love that disposable cannons. It's like, all right, bring in another <laughs> one. Let's go. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I say I say meeting in the middle and going A tier is fair. All right, A tier. I like that one. Was that our? Uh, was that the fifth and final one on that one, Jeff? That was the last one for today, indeed. Oh my goodness! Believe it or not, we aren't at an hour yet. We've done it, Jeff. We finally managed to record one. <laughs> That is less than an hour long. It's it's a miracle. It's... <laughs> I know. And you know what? It might even be shorter after we uh, do some cleaning up on this. So uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far into the tier list, uh, we have how many are left at this point now, Jeff? Do the math here. Uh, we did 10 last time, five this time, so there should be 10 left, which I, I'm assuming we, we should get done in probably two more episodes. That being said... As we said in the first episode, if you listen to this and there's an empire that we haven't, right, that you think you, we should or that you want to hear of in the future or include in a list, I wouldn't be opposed to continuing it past those episodes if we get enough in at some point as well. Yeah, and I, I actually really like that idea of this being kind of like this uh, big, ever-expanding kind of tier list. I, I really like that idea as well, Jeff. So we're definitely keep, gonna keep doing that. If you wanna see more, you've got more suggestions for tier lists, um, we'll continue on uh, down that path. Uh, but until next time, thank you so much uh, for tuning into the Amateur Ages podcast. My name is Martin Van Coy, AKA Kazi. You can subscribe to me here at the YouTube channel. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Cause and Effect, or at Van Coy. And you can follow Jeff, at it's a new twitter account right it's the annie historian is that what it is it is indeed it's short for animated historian but yes what i could oh i thought it was twitter anakin handle. i thought you're just a huge star wars fan jeff you know <laughs> well everybody knows i do hate sand so <laughs> yeah i'll never go back there again little annie little <laughs> annie historian he didn't go to the dark side he just really enjoyed libraries <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. Until next time, hit that like button, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next time.